What's good, everybody, and welcome back to the channel for a brand new series I am starting here on MLB The Show 23. You could probably tell from the thumbnail, but this will be a zero overall draft only franchise. I did a zero overall draft only rebuild earlier in the cycle to kind of get used to the new drafts that they did. And that video got a ton of love. I think it's up near 6,000 views or something, which is about three times more than any other video has gotten on this channel so far. So um, there's interest in a draft only video. Maybe there could be interest in a draft only franchise. Um, and so we're starting one here. Before we dive into what I want to do for this particular episode, though, there are some items of business I'd like to talk about. First off being that this will not replace or really affect my athletics franchise that we are already doing here on MLB The Show 23. I honestly like to have two series running. I think that's the best pace because I, I want to get more videos out um, in a week. I'd like to get five or six and that puts us at there's you no know, three episodes per week for every series, which I do think is a good pace and the pace that I want to maintain. And so that gives us room to have the athletics and this brand new franchise that we are starting. However, it is bad news for anyone that was hoping for season four of Brooklyn Bulls. Um, I was trying to convince myself that it was a good idea. We had a sick draft um, last episode, but I just can't really get excited about the prospect of playing men 23. Honestly, ever since they screwed over my uh, San Antonio Express franchise, just my enthusiasm for the game went down. And so um, now that there's a new game that people are enjoying, and I'm enjoying a lot as well, it's just hard for me to go back to Madden. I will be doing a long-term sim um, for that franchise, but I just couldn't commit to it at least another 13 episodes of, of that series. And so we'll be doing both of our series here over on MLB The Show 23. Second item of business is that if I'm going to have two series of the same game going on, I, there needs to be something different about them so that I don't feel like I'm kind of doing two of the same project. And what's going to be different, apart from this being draft only, is that this will be 100% a CPU versus CPU gameplay series. And so we will still be hopping into the games, but I will not be on the stakes controlling the players. It'll be CPU versus CPU. I scoured the internet found some settings, some sliders that work for other people on CPU versus CPU in this game. I'm going to try them out, tweak them as we go along. I don't think there's enough offense in CPU versus CPU with the base sliders, but I think this could be beneficial. This, I guess, will impact uh, the athletics franchise a little bit, and that will probably just stop doing CPU versus CPU altogether, something that I had been sprinkling in. And so that will be kind of out of the athletics franchise and it will be the focus here of this draft only franchise um third item of business is that we will be taking over the chicago white Sox here like i said we do have a zero overall roster i decided against going with a relocation kind of you know uniform set and new stadium um just because two reasons mainly firstly there have been some problems with relocation teams in the game where it's like numbers aren't showing up on jerseys and stuff, and it just kind of looks odd. And I didn't want that to be part of this series um, since they're having problems. They did update their game today. I'm recording on uh, Thursday afternoon. So maybe they fixed that with this update, but didn't want to risk it. And the second reason is that this might be a spoiler for those who are fans of the Athletics franchise. We might be relocating that team i don't want to give away what would be happening there but uh one hint would be that we might be sending them where they're actually going in real life ahead of season four so i just feel like if we're relocating one franchise didn't need to do it here so why choose the red sox uh white sox excuse me um one reason mainly and that's jerseys if we're not gonna have anybody from the base roster um that's only the the thing that you have left right is i guess also, you have stadiums as well, but I'm not too familiar with everybody's stadium, so I wouldn't know which one's like the coolest stadium in the league or anything. But jersey-wise, I feel like their double-A teams, jerseys are fine. They're they're pretty nice, you know, 
Pinstripes are a classic in baseball. I do like their AAA team. Um, it looks really similar, but I just like the the black and the gold color scheme quite a bit. And then the main one being their their MLB roster. And just taking a look at some of their uniforms, I love these alternate ones. They look awesome. I think the alternate twos look slick. They're base home. Once again, the classic pinstripes. But um, perhaps my favorite of them, these City Connect jerseys. Oh, they look so good. So these City Connect and their alternate ones, like those two jerseys are two of my favorite in all of baseball. And I like their alternate twos as well. So really like their jerseys will be with the White Sox. And then the last item of business before we start actually drafting this team and getting it assembled is how I want to execute this series. And so how we're going to be doing that is we'll be kind of starting out with the Barons as our main team. When we draft people, they'll all be going into double A or maybe single up. They're terrible. I don't know. But when we hop into CPU versus CPU gameplay, it will be with the Barons. We will not be taking a look at all at the Knights, at all at the White Sox, only the Barons. And we'll do that until we win a championship at the double A level with the Barons. Once we've done that, our main team will become the Knights who actually aren't showing here, guy. I just, our division's just huge. We'll be going with the Knights. And then the Knights will be our main team until we win a championship with them. And only then will we start to watch CPU versus CPU in the major leagues. And while we're with the White Sox and maybe with when we're still with the Knights, it kind of depends on how far it takes for us to win a minor league championship. But we can go and watch lower levels, but you know, when the Barons are our major team, we won't watch levels higher than whatever our main team is at the moment. So really trying to win a championship at all three levels of baseball. Technically there's single A as well. That's just not a playable, playable level in this game. So trying to win a championship at all three levels. So there will be kind of three phases of this franchise. As for this particular episode, I was trying to think when I wanted to start actually hopping in, how long would it take me to build a team? And I'm giving myself two drafts as well as two UDFA classes. I forgot to mention that that was part of my business is what do I, what do I consider draft only? Obviously the MLB draft will be part of it. I think UDFA will be part of it as well, much like it is in my Madden franchise. And how I can tell if they're UDFAs is I think is pretty easy. You just go to the free agent pool, look for somebody that's of the right age and you can say, oh, you might confuse like Buddy Cortez is only 19 years old, but not really because everyone, whether they're a free agent or on a team, their ratings change throughout the season. So this guy, we would know he's not, you know, somebody who didn't get drafted just because his ratings have changed. So going to the free agent pool, I'm looking for people of draft age between 18 and 24 who whose ratings haven't changed. We can snag those players as well. I've been debating whether or not the Rule 5 draft will be a part of this franchise. Um, it wouldn't be effective until Phase 3 when the White Sox are our main team just because they have to be on your Major League team to be in the Rule 5 draft. Rule 5 draft is technically a draft and this is a draft only franchise. I'm pretty 50-50 on it. If you think the Rule 5 draft should eventually be part of this series, let me know. Either way, whether you do or you don't, and whatever, if anybody cares and comments on it, it's probably going to be the way because I'm honestly 50 50 on it. So, like I said, I'll be going through the draft and the rest of this season, as well as the next draft and the rest of next season. I'm giving myself two seasons to fill out a 26 man double A roster, and then starting in the 2025 season is when we'll start to get gameplay and i will show the gameplay sliders that i'm using that i found on um, uh, operation sports in the next episode when the gameplay actually starts i haven't actually imported the gameplay sliders yet so with all of that out of the way i know that was a lengthy intro but we are starting a new series here with some rules attached so i had to explain it a little bit let's get in to draft number one and i'll talk about the prospects that i've scouted that i like in this draft. and here we are at the draft before we hop into it let's go ahead and just talk about some of my favorite players in the class one guy that i don't think is gonna slip to us um 
and that I just don't know if he could take just because of the fact that he's injured. But until I figured out he was injured, he was kind of my hopeful guy. Just velocity pitcher with strikeouts. Stamina is going to be a decent spot as well. Break will be fine. His control is going to suck, but he's the top rings player by our scouts. And I tend to think that's a fair assessment. Uh, just the fact that he's injured. Maybe he slips down to 15, And but do we take a guy that's injured? Um, it's a tough sell, but I mean, if you hit, that's really high potential and guy who is not going to start out too bad either. Another couple of pitchers that I like here to start out. First, Mariano Velasquez. He earns a 4.2 star rating. Forgot to mention until now, but if you follow my content for Madden, you'll recognize this star system. I'm trying it out here on MLB The Show 23, starting here with this draft. Um, it's definitely a work in progress. Probably going to have to tweak some things just because I feel like a lot of people got a four star rating this way. But um, 4.2 for Mariano Velasquez tied um, for the best of any pitcher. Boston and Brink aren't, don't look quite as good, but um, he looks like a solid pitcher. And then Ernest Lopez, he opted out of his doctor's exam, but uh, strikeouts per nine, walks per nine look like they're going to be in a decent spot. Stamina looks great for him. Velocity and Brink will be average. And then, but the guys I like the most here, potentially with the 15th big. Number one is Kevin Sandoval, I guess tied for number one. He earns the highest grade at a 4.4 here. Looking at these offensive stats, doesn't look like anything special. Uh, maybe he could have some good power versus lefties. He's a switch hitter though. So maybe he's got some good time to develop. Defensively is where he will shine. He has a potential to be one of the best defensive catchers in all of baseball in his prime. Gonna start out at 21 years old. Gonna be somewhere low 50s, high 60s. I think for year one, maybe going a little bit more upside swinging makes more sense as long as we're getting guys in like at least the mid to high 50s at a minimum, which Kevin Sandoval would be at a minimum here. Um, just because in year one, we're gonna be drafting guys who we're not gonna be good for many years. It took us, what, nine years? to get to the World Series in our rebuild version of this. And so I'm totally fine drafting a guy who has a higher ceiling as long as he's at least okay to start. I don't want to be drafting guys who are going to come in with 40s overalls, but I'm more okay with 50s. As we get later on, I'll probably be searching for more high floor. But speaking of high floor, this other guy tied with uh, the catcher for top ranked player is Lawrence White here. Now this guy offensively contact looks incredible. Power versus righties looks the best of anything. Power versus lefties will be okay. Vision and discipline. I like where those are at. Fielding too, he's just not gonna have much speed, not gonna have much of an arm. Looks honestly kind of a lot like Daryl Kohler who we just drafted with the Oakland Athletics, but uh, I don't think you know, with that arm, he can't really slide over and play third base like we want to do with Kohler. So he also doesn't just doesn't have as much of high of a ceiling as Kohler, it looks like here. So we go high floor, low ceiling, but going to be a good offensive player for sure in Lawrence White. Or we go more defensive heavy um, in Kevin Sandoval and just hope that the switch hitting catcher can develop. So I think that's kind of the main predicament for us in round one, but we got to see who's actually even available. I'll continue to talk about players available in later rounds as we get to them. But um, let's go ahead and get this draft started. And the Pirates will pick first and they will go Ray Bautista, who was number one on our board. Looks like their scouts saw him similarly. They're willing to uh, take a risk on the injured pitcher and draft him first overall. Second, we've got another pitcher who uh, we scouted, ended up being top 10 on our board. Um, 
just never expected him to follow us, which is why he didn't end up being really on my board. I just scouted him because I scouted basically all of the pitchers in the Central and International because there were a lot of pitchers there. And then Tim Edney going to the Tigers. If I thought he had any chance of going to us, I would have scouted him for sure. Offensively, he looks like the best you've ever seen. Maybe even generational. The fact that he wasn't number one on the board, the fact that he's 20 overall, uh, 20, sorry, years old, makes me think that he's not generational, but I mean, looks like an incredible offensive talent here. Anyone else went go before us? That's was a surprise. So Mariano Velasquez, he was on my board for round one. Both of the guys that were on my shortlist are here. Again, I feel like in future years, Lawrence White would, I think, pretty easily be the pick. But since we're younger on, and I feel like catcher in general is a harder position to draft. I think we will go upside swinging a minimum of 85 potential here for Kevin Sandoval. It's intriguing, and he's going to be a good impact behind the behind the plate from day one. Catching, we just got to get those hitting stats up, and I think he's got the potential to maybe develop them. I'm talking about a couple guys that I really like to go ahead of us here. Lester Paquetti goes uh thought he was a really good offense really only first baseman i'm um, not maybe even a dh kind of guy and another guy who was kind of offense only kirby yamazaki really contact vision and discipline are his calling cards not gonna be much of a fielder and then where did our friend lawrence white go he goes 23 to the cleveland guardians in terms of other players that i am fond of here um, Ernest Lopez, somebody that I thought could be an option even in the first round, wasn't on my shortlist in the first round, first chant per se, but uh, definitely pretty high on my consideration list for second round. The problem that I have with pitcher early is that I feel like late all I have is pitchers. Alden Evans here is somebody that I am interested in. Contact, vision, Excellent spots. He's a little bit more low ceiling, high floor kind of guy. But since we went ceiling with our first pick, I think getting somebody who's not going to be a power guy, but contact wise, vision, discipline, going to be really good. Going to be able to maybe still a bag or two as well out in right field. Fielding wise, he's not going to be anything excellent, but he is a corner outfielder. So it's not the worst thing. Very interested in Alden Evans. Um, a couple other guys that are on the board. Corey Viscaino, um, another guy who's mostly defensive. Don't know if we want to do that twice in a row. And then the other guy on my list is kind of already gone. Another guy who is high floor, low ceiling here in Dexter Baco could be the pick. But of the kind of high floor, low ceiling guys, I just think Alden Evans has a, at least a little bit higher of a ceiling. So, and we've scattered them more. So without further ado, passing on Ernest Lopez is hard for me, but I'd like to at least get a couple of position players while there's guys I like still on the board. We are now into round three and our favorite guy did go off the board. Where did he go? Were we close? Looks like he went well before our pick here in the competitive balance round 73 about 17 picks before ours now like i said i think there's a lot of good pitching left as you see at the top of our board is basically pitchers if you want to go another guy who's going to be rated in the 50s with high potential john mazer guy here probably low 80s velocity somewhere high 50s low 60s break High 60s, low 70s, again with stamina, and then just potential through the roof. You're looking to go maybe going to be better now than Buster Pringle is your guy. Um, and his ratings honestly look pretty good to me. None of these guys are ranked. Jimmy Teague is ranked the best by our scouts. I just don't know if I agree with him 
over these other guys. That strikeout and walks per nine are really low. Pedro de la Cruz, his overall range is just too low for me, and there's nothing really sticking out about him. And so I think Daniel Driver here, another guy with good velocity. He's got the best of the bunch here. Definitely interested in drafting him at certain at some point. I would like to see if there's anybody that's good that maybe we could snag, take a chance on here just because there are so many pitchers. I mean, you look at Leandro Velasquez here. He looks like he'd be worth at least just a shot in the dark. Didn't scout him. I don't know why. I guess you only have so many weeks to scout, right? This guy's a shot in the dark, but I think he might be worth taking. That's interesting. We like a lot of pitchers, so I'm just gonna we're just gonna take one more shot in the dark here. Let's do it. I, I'm ready to do it. Um, very early to take a shot in the dark. Um, if somebody's potential, something that I saw another YouTuber TNJ do. Um, if somebody's potential comes in lower than their overall, I will raise their potential to their overall, which looks like it will be the case probably here with Landro Velasquez. Um, so just know that I won't raise it any higher than that, but I will raise it to that. Okay. So we got Buster Pringle still available. We've got John May still available. Daniel Driver. I kind of like all three of these guys. If, I, if we can come out with all three, I would be ecstatic. Um, who would we go with first, though, is the question. I think we go with John May first. Let's just make sure we get somebody who has future ace potential. Uh, and then we go Driver or Pringle here in the fifth round. I think we will go with... Buster Pringle, welcome to the squad. And then Daniel Driver remains on the board in the sixth. So I think we got three pretty solid picture, pitchers in round four through six. Like I said, I wanted to prioritize position players early in the draft just because there were a lot of not ranked pitchers for us on the board. And I was confident we could at least get two. We ended up getting three. Um, didn't draft any bullpen in this draft. So that's something that we'll have to prioritize in the UDFA market and in next year's draft, depending on how the UDFA market goes. Let's get into signing these draft picks though. First up, we get Kevin Sandoval for just a little bit over his bonus demand. I think it was like 3.4 million or something like that. He signs in the first stage. Donald Driver is up next. Half a million going to him. He says yes. Another half a million to John May. Everybody has high interest in us, except for Leandro Velasquez. I'd like to get some extra scouting on him anyway. Buster Pringle is here. Are we going to sign every Okay, so we signed everybody that I wanted to. I wanted to get some more scouting on Leandro Velasquez. He's the only guy that we drafted that we really didn't scout much. So I'll be going forward a few different sessions, and then we'll see where he stands. All right, we've gone forward several... And he's still only 45% scouted, but um, yeah, looks to be worth a contract. We'll, we'll offer it for him here. We just need bodies at the end of the day anyway, even if he sucked, uh, which he certainly still might. Let's go ahead and take a look at these ratings. Just before we get to that, also want to shout out any big time trades that are happening. Alexis Diaz, closing pitcher acquired by the Rangers, would be a lot bigger of a deal if we were still in the athletics franchises that would be in our division but here it is not let's look at the players here now all right you know what i'm kind of like what i'm seeing here let's start with kevin sandoval here 62 overall 91 potential so everything came about the middle of their ratings looking at his versus left and versus right little boxes there his hot zone versus righties is looking really good and 
gives me hope that he can maybe develop his hitting well with us. And like I said, fielding wise, he is already the real deal. 75 fielding off rip, 70 arm. Um, he's going to be hard to steal bases against. And a really big part of what our future looks like. Getting catcher, I think, early is crucial. It's just such a hard position unless you get like a generational catcher to get a good player. Alden Evans ends up with low B potential. Um, so he's somewhere in the middle of his ranges again, 64 overall. But contact hitting looks to be really good. Vision at 74, discipline 60, contact at 66 and 77. 74 speed with 82 steel. Not much of a fielder at all, but in terms of contact hitting, I think we've got a guy who's going to be good in double eight next year. Leandro Velasquez, I will be upping his potential to 74, like I said. And he looks like a guy who's just going to be all around solid. Um, fielding is in a decent spot. Speed's in a decent spot. Contact power, okay. Vision, good. And switch hitter as well. I think this is a win despite the fact that he's only 74 potential just a guy who can come in and be good for us um even though being good for us maybe not be the most might not be like the most important thing for year one but um at round three i'm willing to take the swing john may 96 potential ends up kind of on the high end there 83 velocity was what like one less than his Right, it was like then his highest he could possibly go. So John May looking really good. Even his overall, he was what 52 to 62, ends up 59. Looking really good. I like what I see from him. Buster Pringle, already 71 overall. He's gonna go up to 79. So I like I like that we were able to get, you know, one of each here. We got one guy we're shooting with the stars with a couple more safe guys. We got one guy two guys that were shooting with the stars here and one safe guy. We got a little bit of everything here, um, just so in case some of these more developmental guys don't pan out. We for sure at least got some people that are gonna impact for us. I think we did really good, but let's see some of the, the other guys. Um, I particularly wanna see the Cleveland Guardians. Lawrence White ends up 72 overall with 81%, 81 potential. Hitting wise, gonna be good. Fielding at 70 is good. Reaction at 60. Um, if this was like a year three or year four draft, maybe you could argue we needed a first baseman that this guy would be better for us. But for year one, I think I like the Sandoval pick over Lawrence White. Um, they got a nice reliever here. Something that I wish we would have gotten. This would be a pick that I would like a lot. Guy with 80 arm. I'm jealous of this pick. A power, power hitter with a big arm in right field. That's a that's a nice pick. 99 potential with Frank Lopez. Goodness. All right. Guardians with a killer draft. I really like this draft. I'd have taken any of these guys. Except for maybe like these guys aren't great. But goodness. Uh, Tim Edney ends up being a 71 with 85 potential. Those offensive stats are all really good. Uh, maybe that potential is a little bit disappointing considering what his ranges were. Henry Norris. Really good pick as well. Good power bat for them. Detroit, I think, had an awesome draft. Um, Henry Norris, um, surprised I didn't scout him. He would have been a solid pick for us for sure. Um, Jarrett Dodd, 46 with 92 potential. Um... 65 with 82 would have been a good, good, good pick here. I think he was on our board. I like what we got with our pitchers anyway. Um, Mike Molina, that's actually lower than he was supposed to be. I, we scouted him and he was looking better than that. It looks like their scouting was accurate though. Pedro de la Cruz was on our board, 98 potential, 57 overall. He's a little bit better than I thought he would be, but... Um, I'm still, like I said, very content with what we got. Pitcher. Um, Joaquin Arnold, I remember, was on our board. Super low velocity, though. I just don't know how that's going to play in the game. Nice pickup by the Mariners here, Brian Yabu. 
But um, yeah, I honestly think our draft was good. I want to see the Pirates draft. See if anybody catches our eye as well. This would have been a good pick. Aaron Hoffman. That's a good pick by the Reds for sure. Um, he was picked before us. Ray Bautista ends up 64th, 81 overall. So I think um, the fact that he was injured did affect his ratings because his potential was supposed to be a lot higher. And that's what drafting injured players do, does. It has a chance at impacting their ratings and their potential, which is a good thing. Lester Paquete was also on our board. Um, would have been a good pick for sure, I think. So um, there you have it for the drafts. I guess it's time to fast forward until we get to part one of the UDFAs. All right, here's a look at the UDFA class that we will be signing. Might need to up some of these by 10K just to make sure they sign here. Uh, what I got here, I realized that we should probably put a little bit of rules here for the UDFAs. Um, I will not be signing anybody if there's a rookie that's either over 70 overall or has a potential. I won't be signing them as a UDFA. For example, somebody that we saw the... Was it the Guardians pick? Somebody picked Frank Lopez, who we know was a 99 potential. He's here in free agency. Um, that's obviously tempting, but we're just not going to do it. He's a 49 overall anyway, which is that ever going to pan out? But um, 70 overall or a potential won't be somebody that we sign in post draft. Uh, free agency, but we got a decent bit here. Um, I think surprisingly, we're actually going to have a full pitching staff with this. Um, we'll have a couple of Joe Randoms in there at, at position players, but uh, we could almost fill the team after year one, honestly. So, one more draft, one more UDFA, and then We'll have a team that we will be playing with going into the year 2025. Like I said, I'm just gonna make sure we get some of these guys by offering them 10,000 to make their bars full, but um, all these guys should sign. So I will see you as we prepare for draft number two. All right, we are ready for the second draft, the last one before we will start to really get things going here in the franchise. Let's go through the top of the draft. I really think there's uh, four options for us here. Uh, starting with Carl McIntyre, he gets a 4.6 star rating for us. Uh, specializes in his fielding and his, his contact. Uh, lefty bat, which I do like to see. Uh, gonna be a threat on the bases as well. And so I think he really offers a little bit of everything, except for maybe power, but um, I think this, this type of arch archetype is going to be really helpful for us. Getting a center fielder who actually can be a good asset at center field. I know we went defense heavy to start last draft, but I think this guy is a better player at the plate than what we had last time, which of course you want to see because we are picking number one. A couple other position players that I like here, Jeremy Prater. Um, Tied for best rating. Another guy. Contact. Fielding looks good. Just not quite as much of an athlete. Doesn't really have much of an arm. Still doesn't have the power. Vision and discipline do look better than McIntyre, though. Um, being ranked at 40, our second pick is at 37. There's a chance he's there. Um, and Jason Gill. Another guy. His ranked is 50. If we can get one of Gill or Prater in the second round, that would be incredible. Uh, switch hitter. Another guy we're seeing a lot of the same, where it's contact, it's vision and discipline, it's fielding. There's a lot of that here at the top of this draft. And so um, I really like that. There's one pitcher that I think is worth a look. He uh, comes just below these guys in terms of how he ranks for me, but easily think this guy's worth a first round pick early. I think uh, whoever gets him is gonna get a good pitching prospect here in Lincoln Bird. I also like the name. And then. Uh, just one more shout out, Blake Boyer here. I could see him being maybe a second round pick. He's number one ranked by our scouts. I just think he's a tier below what we're 
saying easily worth the second round pick though if um if we take i'm, I'm leaning carl mcintyre with the first pick uh, i just think he's a little bit better of a fielder and athlete than what we're seeing maybe not quite as good of a hitter but i think he's gonna be an awesome fielder and base runner so i, I kind of like what we're getting there even though he doesn't have much interest in us i'm confident we'll be able to get it up and then if one of these guys is available in the second we take him if not boyer and boyer ranked at 120 he might even be available with our third pick at 75. if we can get if we can get mcintyre one of gill or prater and then boyer that would be insane so uh, i guess let's let's get into the draft and see if we can do it and then once we get towards the later part i don't have as good of scouting on the later part just because there were so many options that i kept wanting to get scouted at the top of the draft that i just didn't get as much scouted deep so i feel like we will be having to kind of take some chances with our later picks like i mentioned even though he has low interest in us and he's only ranked seventh by our scouts i think this is a player well worth the pick here at number one overall carl mcintyre welcome to the squad somebody i think with the catcher that we took last year in center field two very important defensive positions that we got that are going to be high impact defenders this is cpu versus cpu there's going to be some slider changes so getting players that can actually play defense is going to be important and then bird goes number two i mean i think he's the best pitcher in the class i think cincinnati did well there pick three now coming up um oh oops i accidentally pressed the home button we've got henry peralta did not scout him but uh ace could have got a good one there you never know i'm just going to simulate to our pick here and see jason gill is still here so get a couple of outfielders to start this draft lefty and a switch hitter both going to be impacts on both sides of the plate i do think so this is about as good of a start as i could have asked for i probably would have preferred the first baseman a little bit over gill but i mean i, I was willing to take him with our second round pick and just like i said this would be an insane start Blake Boyer's also available in the third. Let's go. Okay, you can play most of the infields, short, second, third, switch hitter. Um, getting a lot of contact, so maybe going forward, we should prioritize some power. Um, but I really like where the draft has gone for us thus far. So taking a look at what we have left, we got uh, Matthew Ullman here, who I think solid player if unspectacular but um definitely worth a look and then miguel polanco i'd say between these two uh it's pretty close honestly where are they ranked by our scouts 2965 there's also francisco vasquez he's ranked a little bit further down the board but i just like where his velocity break and stamina are you know, Polanco would already have 93% interest in joining us. That's kind of insane. I think the higher walks and home runs per nine. I feel like Ullman here is kind of similar to Va Vasquez in terms of their strength is in stamina, velocity break at Trio. So I'll take somebody who looks like they'll have a little bit better per nines here in Miguel Polanco. And then Francisco Vasquez is here in the fifth. And then at six, I think we should take maybe a chance at reliever. Rolls seems like maybe a good shot. Yeah, that starter's not looking good. Let's see if there's just somebody who maybe looks like they've gone overlooked. Wouldn't mind an infielder either. It seems like we haven't gotten a lot of infielders. Angel Jimenez. I 
don't really love any of the pitching options available. I don't love him either, if I'm being honest. Uh, Bo McDermott. You know what? The name McDermott has worked for us this year. Let's just try Bo McDermott. And that will be the end of the class. Let's go and get these guys signed. Got Miguel Polanco. Got his... He started with 93%, so that was going to be an easy one for us. And then I think Francisco Vasquez should be pretty easy to sign as well. He is. Signing interest, we didn't do nearly as good of a job this year as we did last, but we get the three guys that we had over 50% all to sign. And so we just got to work on some percentages here, probably some scouting here with Bo McDermott as well. But uh, I'll simulate forward a few, a few signing sessions and we'll get back to these guys. All right, I'm just gonna increase these offers a lot just because we have a ton of money and these guys have not been cooperative. And there we go, we got all three just by raising them a bunch. We still had 1.5 million left over, so it wasn't much of a problem for us. Let's go ahead and let's check these ratings. No big trades, it looks like, happening in the league. Carl McIntyre will be a 70 overall with 88 potential. Kind of reminds me of where Eduardo Silva started. A much different player than Eduardo Silva. Uh, as far as Eduardo is mostly just kind of a power hitter and a base runner. This guy's got base running, fielding, and contact more so. Vision at 49, discipline at 62, clutch at 74. Durability is only 25. Average is 25? That's low, dude. I hate to break it to you. Y'all are capping. But that's disappointing. Uh, wow, Bo McDermott. Uh, one Brett McDermott is not like another, but Jason Gill here, 68 overall with 96 potential, 90 durability. So two opposite ends of the durability spectrum here. Maybe we should have gone for first base at number one. We'll definitely take a look at him. Contact, vision, discipline, and building that. Everything looks good there. Blake Boyer kind of just looks like a more calmed down version. Not as good of a fielder, not as good as a contact, but still has high potential at 92. Miguel Polanco, 67 overall with 79 potential. Don't hate it. And then Francisco Vasquez, low overall. I like where his velocity breaking salmon is, but uh, very low B potential, and but yeah, but McDermott's just a miss. Let's go ahead and take a look where that. So I want to look at the Reds pick because they picked the starting pitcher that looked really good. Wow, the Braves only signed one guy. Goodness. Lincoln Bird, 68 with 88 potential. Five pitch mix. That's a good pitching prospect for Cincinnati. 80 durability. Then Jeremy Prater, 65 with 92 potential. Wow, okay. This class, man, is nuts. 62 durability. So his durability is not excellent either, but it's much better than ours. Um, let's see. Five overall worse now. Four better potential, better durability. I think you could argue that Jeremy Prater is better, but as long as he, of course, doesn't get injured, which is a big if, I think you gotta love the fielding of McIntyre here. Just the speed to be able to get to balls and in the 70s for most of his fielding attributes. So durability is, is a rough one for him, but other than that, We've got a really sick class. So we're gonna end this episode off with one more UDFA class. Then we're gonna just take a preview of the roster before episode two, where we will finally hop in and play, or I guess watch some of these guys play CPU versus CPU style. I'll catch you when we get to those UDFAs. Before we get to the UDFA class, we've kind of overhauled the staff this year. I'm not sure, I don't know if somebody could tell me if the, these pitches, everybody above farm director is only for MLB roster, or if it's for, if it'll help the guys in the minor leagues as well. But um, we've got 
a really good looking staff now with mostly A's with just one B and uh, he's looking good anyway. So this is the staff going forward for the squad. All right, here is our class of UDFAs. Highest overall, just under that 70 overall threshold is Elvis Rivas, another center fielder with some, doesn't have potential as in terms of long-term, but it's gonna be a good fielder. Uh, and then there's a 666 overall reliever, a 66 C potential pitcher, no B potentials here. Uh, there was one guy where if there wasn't a restriction on, I'm trying to think, where was he right here? That a 70 overall, we could have gotten ourselves a 72 overall with C potential, but uh, no 70 pluses for us here. And then, so we've just got some guys. I don't even know if everybody here is going to make the team. I just kind of went everybody 55 overall plus with C potential plus or 60 overall just in general. I give them an offer and then we'll kind of just see who looks the best. Maybe we'll put some guys at Class A, maybe even Triple A, even though we won't be watching Triple A. Maybe some of our guys that we are as invested in, we could just put up to Triple A. Um, just to keep them, but slowly start to replace these zero overall players. But um, I'm going to simulate to the end of the offseason. We'll take a look at what our double-A roster is going to look like. And honestly, I think it's going to be pretty good. All right. Offseason is about over here. So let's go ahead and take a previewed look at what our double-A team is going to look like. I forgot to check people's stats at the end of the year before minor league season ends, which means you can't look at their stats, but we can see how some of the players that we drafted in the first year improved. Buster Pringle up to a 74 overall. He looks like he will be our ace to start next year. Miguel Polanco, I just drafted him. He's our second best overall on our double-A uh, team. And then John May got up three overall as well. Uh, nice to see plus four to his clutch. I'd like to see that hits per nine that was so low go up more than one, but uh, such things happen. Daniel Driver with it, even with a 98 mile an hour four seamer, got four strikeouts per nine. Still has not even gotten into the 30s in that one, though. Diego Moya will be there as well. He went up six home runs per nine. You'd like to see that. And then Francisco. Vasquez. Um, needs a lot of work, only 53 overall, but he will be pitching for us. There will be a couple of guys at the AAA uh, level as well with just C potential from non zero overall guys. In terms of relievers, same thing. There will be some guys there. But our AA team will have uh, Ezra Rodriguez, we'll have David Ryan, Luke McMahon, Kyle Hammonds. Let's see uh, Ezra Rodriguez at least. Let's see how he did because he is somebody that I think could be with us for quite a while. Good upgrades there. Luke Hammond had some solid upgrading. I might switch over some relievers between AAA and AA. I don't, actually, no. I think I think they're set up well. Don't have any closers. Kevin Sandoval, probably the guy we want to attention to the most on see how he did uh plus five discipline is nice still hasn't even gotten the 30 there vision is now up to 40 contact versus right he's been up for um, and then continued to develop as a fielder i'm excited to see him play next year to a 65 overall really need a first baseman the more i think about it the more maybe we regret not taking that first baseman but i think first base um that's something that's not the hardest to draft in this game. We got Benito Vasquez, who is kind of just already at his potential, so he's not going to be doing much improving. Uh, Marty Dempsey, somebody that we just got. Uh, Jeff Melvin as well, Blake Boyer as well. And Eugene Goff was with us last year. He played well. He will be playing at AAA for us next year as Jason Gill. I want to be part of our main team over there in left field. Might even put him over in right. Not sure about that. Maybe 
Might do a, I might do some slight tweaking, but double A, Leandro Vasquez. I think Leandro Vasquez will actually play right field for us. So the Carl McIntyre can play center. We got Elvis Rivas as well, who I'd like to get some playing time. He's not going to get any better though. So maybe having him as a backup, especially because, you know, we do have very low durability. So I feel like Elvis Rivas as a backup actually isn't a bad idea. Um, and then Alden Evans back for his second year. Let's see how he did. He hit really well. I'd like to see what those numbers are, but it uh, looks like he got a lot better after last year. So that's nice to see. I honestly think we could be a good double A team next year. I wouldn't be surprised if we have a good record. Let's just take a look at it. I could few guys in the 70s, a lot of guys in the high 60s. I feel like that's pretty good for a double A team. Um, I guess I will have to tell though, as we will hop into our first gameplay next episode. You stuck with me this long. I appreciate it. That is all I have for this first episode of a brand new franchise series. I'll be back soon and I will see you then.